Hey YouTube, how you doing? Thanks for stopping by. This is Matthew with Council Guild. Today we're looking at depression and the HPA axis, or the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Um, the reason I did this uh, video or this, this slideshow uh, was in response to uh, this article here. Let me pull this up here. Hang on. Um, the no evidence. <clears throat> um, this was a couple months ago. It came out July twenty. 22, no evidence that depression is caused by low serotonin levels, uh, finds comprehensive review. Um, and it says that, you know, the article suggests that depression is not likely caused by chemical imbalance and calls into question what antidepressants do. Most antidepressants are selective serotonin up reuptake inhibitors which were originally said to work by correcting abnormally low serotonin levels. There is no other accepted pharmacological me mechanism by which antidepressants affect the symptoms of depression. So, I, um, I was kind of, I guess, confused by the article just because it says, you know, no evidence that depression is caused by low serotonin levels. and. It never really, um, it, usually, you know, in the past, I, I, it never really was supposed to be just serotonin that caused depression. Um, it was the HPA axis. Uh, so I don't know if the article's just, the title is, is, is off. I, I'm not sure, but I, I think it's causing a lot of, uh, misinformation I don't like using that word because it's kind of a big word right now but um, and also it's leading people maybe to even stop taking medications um, so let's kind of look at the HPA axis that was what's research and since Aaron Selly discovered in like the 30s that's kind of been what we understand uh, is, is the reason for depression and where it comes from um, so, look, so that's why I'm making this video. It's from that article, uh, but I got some other articles here that I want to show you. First, what is the HPA? Let's let's look at. Um, oops, let's look at. Well, let me get out of this view. Oops. There we go. Let's look at what the HPA is, and I googled, and I found that Simply Psychology had the best explanation of what the HPA is. Um, so let's learn a little bit about that. Uh, let me get that out of the way. <clears throat> uh, it's to maintain homeostasis in the presence of chronic stressors. Uh, activation is required from a complex range of responses, including the endocrine, nervous, and immune systems, collectively known as the stress response. The hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, or HPA axis, is a term used to represent the interaction between the hypothalamus, pituitary gland, and adrenal glands. It plays an important role the body the body's response to stress. The pathway of the axis results in the production of cortisol. You know, I think you can even put at the top of that um, depression is caused by cortisol levels. Serotonin levels is not, I, I don't, it, it's just not, it's not just serotonin. I, I don't, I don't like the title of that article. Um, but cortisol, uh, cor cortisol, the so HPA results in production of cortisol. The aim of the stress response is to provide energy for a long period of time. It does not need to be fast, so it uses hormones as a way of transmitting signals. When a chronic stressor is perceived, the hypothalamus releases CRF, and this is transported by bloodstream. And this is the, I mean, this is the uh, picture here, CRF. Um, transported by the bloodstream to the pituitary gland, which then produces ACTH, which this is also transported by the bloodstream to the adrenal glands. The cortex of the adrenal glands produces corticosteroids, the most important being cortisol. Cortisol metabolizes glucose stored in the liver. This provides a constant supply of energy for the body to deal with the stressor. The hypothalamus is located just above the brain stem and has a key role in controlling many of the body functions, including the release of hormones 
and maintain the body's internal balance. Now, I don't want to go to get too far in the weeds in, in, with the whole neurochemical and, and anatomy of the brain. Um, like this article, it, it does. Um, and I, I just don't want to go into all that. I don't want to, especially if you're not somebody who who studies, you know, bio, bio, biology, psychology, or um, they just kind of kind of want to get like a general information of what the HPA is. So I don't want to go too too into it. But um, how it works uh, when something stressful happens, the initial response is mediated by the sympathetic nervous system. This causes the release of hormones. You're not. <laughs> I always have difficulty. In epinephrine and norepinephrine, which triggers physical responses to stress such as increasing heart rate. About 10 seconds after the initial response, the HPA axis will be stimulated. Firstly, the hypothalamus will release a hormone called CRH. CRH is the central regulator of the HPA, HPA axis. As well as CRH increasing the activity of the sympathetic nervous system, it also works by signaling the pituitary gland, which is located just below the hypothalamus. So there's a picture for you. I like Simply Psychology has pictures, and uh, they really are they make things easy to understand. So um, if you ever have a like, question, go to the simplypsychology.org. Um, they have a lot of. I didn't look at their website, but uh, I kind of glanced at their homepage, and it looked like they have a lot of stuff on there. So. Uh, there are two parts of the pituitary gland, the post and, and anterior. Um, both release different types of hormones to their target organs, which have varying effects. So again, I don't want to get too too deep, too far into the whole anatomy and, but just where what it has to do with depression. Um, Cortisol is a stress hormone. So basically, when you're under stress, something in your environment causes you stress. The HPA kicks in, produces cortisol, which helps you to uh, deal with that stress. Okay, uh, Cortisol helps to mo metabolize the body's energy through the use of glucose so that the body has enough energy to cope with the prolonged stressor. The release of cortisol causes several effects on the body to help it deal with stressors that last longer than a few minutes. An important function is that cortisol increases blood pressure. This then results in more blood supply in the skeletal muscles in the event of a stressful situation requiring physical exertion such as needing to run away or fight. Um, the anti-inflammatory effects of cortisol are brought about by reducing the pro-inflammatory secretion of psycho cytokine and histamine and stabilizing the membranes of cell components Lysosome. So again, I don't want to get into the, the, all the different chemicals, but when it comes to brain, it, it, there's no, it's not, there's no simply, I mean, it's simply psychology, but there's no real simple answer, and it's, and it's very complex, and it, and it has to do with a lot of different hormones and, and, and neurons and systems, and it's very complex, so it's very hard to keep it simple. Um, so cortisol is produced to deal with stressors in your environment. Okay. Helps you deal with them. Increase blood blood pressure. Um, so you're able to do deal with that stressor, and then when the stressor goes away, all that um, goes down. It's not the what is it? not the unsympathetic nervous system. What's the other one? That's the, it's the para. It's called the parasympathetic nervous system. That's the system that brings it all back down to normal. Um, your your HPA levels and. Um, the stress is gone, the para kicks in and brings you back down to normal. Um, <clears throat> let's see, so this is all about cortisol. Let's kind of go, I don't want to go too into that. And here's the dysfunction part. That's kind of what I wanted to get to, but I wanted to kind of give you an idea what the HPA is before we talk about the dysfunction. Um, as discussed, the HPA axis is important in regulating the body's response to stress. However, uh, there can be instances where the response is experiencing issues such as being overstimulated, which can result in physical and or psychiatric problems. Depression, right? That's the psychiatric problem, being overstimulated. The causes of HPA axis dysfunction could result from genetics, 
biological causes for medications, early life environment, childhood traumas, and current life stressors. Some of the general symptoms of HPA dysfunction include feeling, feeling irritable. And when we go through depression symptoms, you'll see a lot of this stuff. Fear, feeling irritable, frequent illnesses, difficulty coping with stress, feeling unexplainable tiredness, feeling overwhelmed, experiencing exaggerated response to stress. A condition called hypocorticalism or Cushing syndrome. I don't want to get into that. We don't need to know about that. Um, Uh, high levels of cortisol could lead to other physical conditions such as diabetes, hypertension, obesity, menstrual irregular, irregularities, muscle weakness, insomnia, and cardiovascular disease. Chron chronic stress from life events can repeatedly cause the HPA to be overactivated and for longer periods of time. Chronic stress, such as from work, illness, or bereavement, can shift the normal circadian rhythm of the release of cortisol, as well as during stress-induced occurrences. After chronic stress, cortisol baseline levels are elevated. This can result in the body's cortisol response to acute stress to be lessened. It may also take longer for stress-induced cortisol levels to return to pre-stress levels. Chronic stress can therefore make the HPA axis more sensitive resulting in higher cortisol exposure or higher cortisol burden following each stressful episode. When there is excessive exposure, this is when it can influence the development of, of neuropsychiatric and metabolic disorders. Long-term stress resulting in overactivation of the HPA axis can result in the development of mental health conditions. Overstimulation of the HPA axis and higher cortisol levels have been found to be implicated in mood disorders such as depression, as well as being linked to anxiety, mood swings, and irritability. Okay. PTSD, a condition that can be developed after experiencing traumatic events, has been shown to be a possible factor for HPA axis dysfunction due to increased levels of chronic stress being experienced. Um, anything else here? But that's kind of where I wanted to, what I wanted to get out of this article. This is also interesting too, keeping the uh, HBO axis regulating normally. Um, let's see. I mean, they, they bring up Cushing syndrome again. Um, let's see if they have anything on in the SSRIs. If mental health conditions such as depression and anxiety are the cause of an overactive HPA axis, it may be useful to take medications which tackle these. This include antidepressants, which work to encourage the circulation of essential neurotransmitters around the brain to reduce symptoms, which could be causing depressive feelings and excessive stress. Now, the article says that um, <clears throat> SSRIs, or serotonin, levels, um, there's no evidence that depression causes, so they say so low serotonin levels cause depression. The SSRIs, uh, work in the brain to prevent serotonin to be reuptake, and you can ask a psychiatrist, you can ask doctors and researchers. They still probably can't give you a straight answer how or why the SSRIs are effective. They, you know, there's just I think it's too complicated. We just don't know. Uh, but taking an SR, SSRI where there's more serotonin in, in the brain uh, has to do with regulating this HPA axis. Okay whether it helps regulate it better than if you could do it on your own. Um, that's what I'm thinking the SSRIs are for. But serotonin is not the reason for depression. It's the HPA axis. So take an SSRI for increased serotonin to stay out there so it doesn't get reuptake. Um, helps the HPA become more uh, regulated, okay? And it said this before, you know, if you go back up here, um, where it says like chronic stress, let me see. Yeah, chronic stress can therefore make the HPA axis more sensitive, resulting in higher cortisol exposure to higher cortisol burden following each stressful episode. 
So it's if you have chronic stress, it, it dysregulates the HPA, or it makes it more sensitive. It, it it puts out more cortisol, like for just small stressors. So it's 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 messed up the HPA, and the serotonin is trying to regulate that. Okay. Um, let me see if there's anything else. A healthy diet with focus on balancing food, avoiding caffeine or alcohol, um, regular sleeping, exercise, relaxation, meditation, yoga. Um, okay, so that's that article there. I hope you have some idea what HPA axis is. Um, it's, it's a process the body goes through in response to stress. That's it. Um, they got the sympathetic nervous system, um, puts out the CRH to the pituitary, and then it has all these chemical responses, but basically cortisol, glucose, energy, okay? It, it, it puts your heart rate up or your blood pressure up. You probably maybe start sweating. You're preparing yourself for that whole fight or flight, right? But nowadays, there's no lion are chasing us or there's no mammoth we're chasing so our stressors are chronic and and they're um, um, yeah they're chronic you know I have to go to work every day work an I-5 job where I what I hate and, and I'm stressed all the time but I can't quit because I have a kids and, and mortgage and I can't get I can't just quit so you're it's kind of chronic stress that you have to deal with every day that's not what uh, our systems are made to do um, okay, so let's get out of this here. Let's go back to the slides. Put my slideshow up. I got some more articles we'll look at in a second. So let's look at the symptoms of depression or dysregulated HPA axis. We have depressed mood. Includes, and this is from the DSM-5. That includes feeling sad, empty, hopeless, helpless, lonely, isolated, tearfulness, and crying spells. Second one, reduced interest or pleasure in activities. Change in appetite, increase or decrease. Change in sleep, too much, too little. Agitation, you're more irritable. And we read that in the article, right? Your high levels of frustration or anger outbursts. Loss of energy or fatigue that interfere, interfere with daily functioning. Feelings of worthlessness or excessive guilt. Difficulty concentrating or making decisions. And recurrent thoughts of death or wanting to die. Okay, so those are some symptoms. And that HPA article kind of brought up a few of those. Um, not all of them, but, you know, that is that is what depression, you know, and, and depression is not going to, it's going to look different to everybody. You may have one or two of these. Uh, well, to be to be diagnosed, you got to have, I think, at least five. Uh, I think more for more than, was it more than two months? I can't remember the, the ranges of date, but... Uh, everybody's going to be a little different, and, and and you may have some of these, you may not. Um, so symptoms of depression. And, of course, there's different severities. You may have mild depression, very, which says it's few, if any, symptoms in excess of those required. And this is from the DSM-5. Uh, to make the diagnosis a present, the intensity of the symptoms is distressing but manageable, and the symptoms result in minor impairment in social or occupational function. There's moderate, the number of symptoms, intensity of symptoms, and or functional impairment are between those specified for mild to, or severe. And then severe, the number of symptoms is substantially in excess of that required to make the diagnosis. The intensity of the symptoms is seriously distressing and unmanageable, and the symptoms markedly interfere with social and occupational functioning. So you have all these symptoms, and then you have the, the levels of severity, mild, moderate, or severe. You know, the people that were tested, were, were, were they all severe? You know, when they're saying that SSRIs don't affect depression, you know, maybe if you had more that were severe, the medications may not be um, as effective as somebody with mild. So, I mean, there's a lot of variables out there that uh, I don't know if they accounted for that or not. Um, but that would be something that may, you know, statistically change your your outcome is were they all severe 
Were they all moderate or were they all mixed? Uh, causes of major depression, and we saw this in the article, can be acquired at any age, uh, but majority is in their late 20s. Why is that? What's going on in their late 20s? What do you think? Career development, family, mortgage, jobs, uh, careers, you know. Um, maybe you, you, that's when, you know, your family members pass away. Uh, a lot of things go on in late 20s. A lot more responsibilities, a lot, a lot of changes uh, that you have to learn to adapt to. Uh, there's just a lot going on in late 20s, early 30s. Men and women are affected equally. I've read some research where it says men, uh, women are have higher rates of depression, but probably because men don't report it and don't seek treatment. But I'm pretty sure it's equal, and, and I think that's from the DSM-5. If you, uh, depending on your level of neuroticism, uh, personality-wise, where you go with, you know, where, what you rate on that. Um, and this is for major depressive disorder. Uh, adverse childhood experiences, that was brought up in the article. Stressful life events, again in the article where the HPA axis is affected. First degree family members with, of individuals with MDD. Uh, so either the genetic component to your HPA axis, maybe you're just genetically you know, made to uh, have that cortisol production um, or how you uh, deal with stress. Uh, major non-mood disorders increase the risk of developing MDD. So if you have uh, a medical illness, uh, maybe you get diagnosed with, with something, that could certainly cause um, an increase in, in developing a, a depressive disorder. Uh, so I put this here because I found it kind of interesting. Um, just common assessment questions for depression. And, and these kind of relate to the symptoms. So like, do you feel your situation is hopeless? You know, someone with depression would probably say, yeah, uh, if, especially if they're dealing with chronic stress. Oh, I'm in a job I can't leave. You know, I'm living paycheck to paycheck. I'm one paycheck away from losing my apartment. You know, it's it's hopeless. Nothing's going to change. Uh, do you find life very exciting? Uh, do you feel pretty worthless the way you are now? Um, are you dropped many of your activities or interests? Are you hopeful about the future? Do you think it's wonderful to be alive right now? Do you frequently get upset over little things? Do you feel full of energy? So the energy part, you know, that was part of the HPA axis, the uh, getting upset over little things, the irritability. Um, but I put these up here because I, I was wondering how you think a pill could change somebody who feels... Um, Hopeless about the future. Because, um, and this is the five-point model, uh, you could take a pill, that's an SSRI, and if we look at the five-point model, uh, this is just like a, a common CBT um, model here. I'm pretty, if you get any CBT book, cognitive behavioral therapy book, this, this is going to be in it. This is pretty standard. Um, if we take a pill... It can't change the way you think. It can't put different thoughts in your head. Um, it can't make you behave differently. It can regulate the HPA to where your your um, um, reach homeostasis and you're balanced. But if you have you know negative core beliefs about yourself or about the world, well, pills not going to change that. Um, so. And it's just when SSRIs, they can be effective, but also there, there's more to it than just taking a pill. And to overcome depression, you've got to also seek out therapy to find out if you do have one of these, you know, core beliefs or negativity or um, maybe someone died and you just don't know how to live without them. You know, a pill's not going to change that. You know, it may make you feel... Um, make you feel better to where you f like maybe you feel like getting something accomplished or, or something like that but it's not gonna change what you think yeah you know, so uh, um I, I wanted to make that point too is ssri's um the the article oops where am i at? ah hang on that uh, the article is you know depression is caused by low serotonin levels there's no evidence for that well um, 
SSRIs aren't going to change how you think. You know, um, they're just going to improve your HPA axis. Um, where is it? Oh, oops. Let me go back down. It's just going to it's going to regulate your HPA axis, uh, so you you don't feel so irritable. Okay, so you don't feel so. Um, low energy and fatigued and uh, it's gonna change um, kind of the biology down here um, oops the biology down here will change that you know so you'll feel less fatigue but also now you gotta start doing things okay you start going out being social or, or um, calling somebody or changing your behavior. This is all about you know cognitive behavioral therapy, which is evidence based and found to be useful for 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 depression. Changing your thought pattern. Maybe you have just cycles of negativity going on in your head. Um, you know the 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 world's gonna end. Um, I don't know uh, what's this world coming to. Uh, I don't know. But those types of thoughts, those irrational thoughts, we have to identify and change. Or your HP axis, HPA axis is never going to change. If you think because of early childhood experiences that you have, um, you, th you think there's danger everywhere, well, your HPA axis is never going to go back to normal, but also a pill isn't going to change the way you think about it. You know, like you need both. You need medication and therapy in order to overcome depression, especially if it's severe. And even if it is severe, you may never overcome it. Uh, but also, if you are if you have a genetic uh, disposition for de uh, depression, you will have to take <clears throat> a medication uh, for, for, for the rest of your life. If it's genetically... Uh, passed down from you know father to or mother to, or mother and father uh, to to their children. Um, let me let me see what what else I got here. Oh, treatments for depression. So CBT cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, this is I mean this is the the five point model for it. Change the way you think, behave, uh, and the rest will um, will follow. Really, you know, if you instead of uh you know you go to work for eight hours and you're miserable and stressed and you hate it but you have to go you know one thing that you might want to look at changing is uh well, you can't quit your job you know you can't change that well what can you change can you change something at home are you just going home and drinking and watching tv oh that's not good well maybe you should go to the gym maybe we should try that you know that's a behavior or maybe it's your thoughts you know maybe we should start looking at you know what is something you're grateful for for this job and does that help when you're stressed out? You know, yeah, this job sucks, but I'm grateful for it, and I'm going to do it the best I can because my family depend on it. You know, um, all those things can help regulate the HPA HPA axis. Um, so CBT, ACT, acceptance commitment therapy. Um, you know, you're going to accept certain, you know, cognitions. Um, and you're going to commit to behaviors that are in line with your values, you know. Um, again, that's another psychotherapy for uh, depression, behavioral activation therapy, which I did a video on. That's all behavior, like small steps every day. What are you doing every day? Um, what small things can you change? Uh, kind of like solution focus in a way. Um, but, you know, they're all... All these different therapies, they're what are you gonna do? You know, how you know, is there a thought you need to change? A pill can't do all that. A pill can 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 regulate your HP, but they're HPA, but you gotta also, you know, change things too. It's 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 a, a lifestyle change and it's a um you know, it's a changing in how you think. So uh, so an SSRI is it is it gonna cure depression? Um no. No, no. But it's going to help. It it helps. It helps you get to that level to where you can make changes. I, I'm not a psychiatrist. I don't I don't push pills on people. Um, but I, I do. I, I've seen them working eight years in inpatient. I've seen how medication can positively uh, impact people. And, and I'm not I'm not against them. I don't prescribe them. But I also know of other ways 
for depression to um, uh, for, to help people with depression. Uh, it, it's a good 50-50. If you take medication for dis- depression, you also got to be doing other things too. So uh, I don't want this to be, um, I mean, this is not a substitute for a conversation with your own doctor. If you have questions about your SSR, I, your depression, you want to talk to them. Um, I, I put this together because I, I think we need to understand that depression, the serotonin is, is it's not what causes depression. And SSRIs are, are not the, um, are not going to cure depression. Like it's, it's, it's a combination of things and, and people are complex and, and it, the, especially the brains and there's nothing, there's no easy treatment. There's no like, like with diabetes, diabetes is a good example. You have to take medicine, but also you got to make lifestyle changes. You know, you got to change the way you eat. You got to change the way you think about food. You got to exercise. You got to lose weight. Um, so it's just, it's a lot of things. It's a lot like that though with depression. You got to take pills, but, but also what else are you doing? What else are you changing? Um, Therapy is a good way of, of <clears throat> unco- uncovering any kind of irrational thoughts or depressive thoughts, negative thoughts. Um, Things like that. So that's why I put this together, and I kind of gave a little bit of information on depression, too. Uh, let me see if there's anything else I want to talk about. Um, is it one to, eh. No, I think that's it. Um, but that's my, my, my video on depression and the HPA axis. Uh, for more information, go to that Simply Psychology uh, link. I'll put it in the video. Uh, description below that link to that if you want to know more about, more about the hpa axis the, the actual cause for depression as far as all the research we've done since the 30s um which is pretty uh, it's pretty um i don't want to say set stone but it's there's enough research there i think to to really say that the hpa axis is truly the reason why depression exists and um and, and serotonin is, is helps regulate it um, yeah, so that's, that's where I'll leave you. If you have any questions, uh, let me know. I'll make a comment. Let me know how I'm doing. Uh, if you have something, maybe uh, something to add. Uh, maybe I got something wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm not perfect, so uh, I'll accept any kind of cl- criticisms. Uh, but with that, I will say good night. Thanks for watching. Uh, have a good one.